So, for our next portion of the program, uh, we're very honored to have Dr. Su Xu to be the moderator of the panel discussion. Su is, the, is a managing partner at Amino Capital. Her investment theme is big data, machine learning, and domain agnostic, including but not limited to data-driven health, consumer software and hardware, drone services, and enterprise services. She was interim CEO of Candy House. I would love to hear more about that. Since 2012, she has been involved with over 100 investments, such as, such as Assemblage, which was acquired by Cisco, Obvious, acquired by Amazon, Umu, acquired by Priceline, Contastic, acquired by Sugar CRM, and is currently providing advisory to a number of fast-growing portfolio startups. Dr. Su Xu began her early stage entrepreneurship when she was the founding scientist at Glyco Mira. She has three patents and over 20 journal publications, and previously was a postdoc fellow at the Stanford University. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me to welcome Dr. Su Xu. So, the three pillars 
of, of um, the new uh, computation platform and also the Webster for all, we believe is AI plus blockchain and also IoT. And based on you know our investment, 130 investments, and then we actually realized that the most um, the domain that gave us most return uh, focusing on four areas. One is the um, you know um, healthcare, and the other is actually fintech. So based on uh, you know we have five unicorns in our portfolio, and three of uh, two of them focus on uh, fintech. The, uh, another two focus on uh, healthcare. Simply because. Uh, this is an area that never, that was not eaten by Web 2.0. So not by social, not by mobile. And you can't just, uh, you know, open up your Facebook and your medical records there. So because these two areas are highly regulated before. And um, in the meantime, we also realized that um, there, in the year of 2016, and then one of our portfolio company, which is obvious, acquired by Amazon, and it was a very successful acquisition. And then the product recognition API was rebranded to be Amazon recognition API, still you know um, uh, providing for free for every one of you to use. So, in, but in the meantime, elsewhere in the world, especially in China. And we've seen a lot of the model company became a unicorn. And one of the reasons is, in China, there were no, not a lot of enterprise software investments. And there were not SIP, not like sales, sales force for enterprise. So that's why a model company has an opportunity to gain the domain knowledge. and. Um, a lot of times people say that was the dirty work. It's not just the scientists working on model anymore. And you have to really go to factory or banks to integrate with their existing IT system. And using your AI and using your intelligence products to replace the existing IT service. So that's why, that's one of the reasons why, you know, elsewhere in, in you know, um, there were more unicorns and, um, um, you know, uh, not just the model company. Beginning with a model company. But in the meantime, we also feel there are challenges and rules to be set for AI. Because AI and blockchain will not make our world a better place automatically. It would just make business more efficient. And for example, like, Nuclear energy, it will warm us faster, but nuclear bomb will kill, kill us faster. So I think it's really important to actually urge every, you know, people that actually work on AI to actually rules to be discussed and determined. Um, okay, so I think to make the better, to make the world a better place is still you and me. Thank you. Okay. So Uh, this is a brief introduction of our company, 
by itself. So Tiamo Motors was founded uh, four years ago. And this year, we are going to launch our massive product production cars. The first car, a uh, electric SUV, equipped with the level 2.5 level of self-driving. And meanwhile, we're also working on a second vehicle, which is electric sedan, that will be equipped with level 3 self-driving system. Uh, as far as, to my knowledge, that's the most competitive self-driving system by the Africa itself uh, in the time frame of 2020. In terms of our users, we are aimed as young internet users who appreciate technology, who appreciate AI, who want a daily change in life experience and driving experience. As far as we know, uh, besides work and home, driving space is the third most important space, private space for people. So it's getting, uh, it's getting more and more importance in terms of experience, daily experience, and especially for intelligence experience for this century. I want to share very briefly of uh, human transportation. Uh, I used to work for Tesla before we built, I built the machine learning team, we built Autopilot 2.0. When I first joined Tesla, I was like most welcoming, like why I uh, worked for a car company, then I came up with this uh, history uh, summary. Uh, so first of all, um, the first vehicle, Model T, only came out about 100 years ago. So human transportation in terms of mechanical device uh, is only has a history of 100 years. So what happened in 100 years is mostly we polished the mechanical functions, we polished the motors, we improved the fuel efficiency, so the driving you know, experience improved by the mechanical part itself. And then we came up with this um, most famous automotive brands like Audi and Mercedes, but now the design of automotive drive by itself, but the mechanical parts, just like a function phone, uh, used to be like Nokia function phone, function phone is separated already. So you can see all kind of colors, all kind of shape of the car, but design itself is really coming to uh, a, a major point. And so Tesla is a great company. While people are improving, still incremental, incremental improving the car, Tesla transformed the vehicle from a mechanical analog device into a digital device. So that the car by itself become a computer. And people from high tech that come over and program it. That's why the self-driving come up. Six years, Tesla has designed three generations of hardware with um, multiple generations of software. So the fundamental goal people you know, are believing in this days, everyone's believing in the US, in China, that the final car in a few years, maybe one decade or more, will become a moving robotic, right? Um, so it can drive around, have a real consequence in the world, can transform the ride sharing industry, can transform a lot of the real, um, you know, a big industry. So that's why a lot of chemicals and the technology are going into the car. In terms of where the technology is going, we are right now at most in massive production, in family owned cars still in the level two um, functions. Um, for example, by 2018, 80% of all the vehicles in China on the market will be equipped with the level two functions. But one of the things we should know is that, uh, in my understanding, Western technology does not suit China. That's why making driving work for China environment is still a solved problem. And here is our strategy, high level. We'll build family-owned vehicles. So we start, we approach a really practical approach. We'll build vehicles and we'll transform uh, the vehicle, just like perform a hard surgery to the vehicle itself make sure the digital highway is in, the computing platform is in, the sensing architecture is in. And then we'll build level two functions, level three functions, including auto parking to address people's parking anxiety. Parking is extremely difficult in China. And addressing people's long road driver, highway driving anxiety, and then address people's uh, traffic peak, morning and evening uh, driving anxiety by traffic jam pilot, and more and more functions. In terms of driving, it's a technology, but it's more about how much problem you can drive, you can solve, how much scenarios you can cover. And meanwhile, you know, as a, a car company, you, you know, we can extend our service and business to other areas as well. Uh, I wanted, this is my last slide. Self-driving is a framework. 
is not two cars or ten cars. It is about a framework. The framework should have a closed format to enable from AI to um, uh, to the car to big data a closed loop. This is the uh, framework that's most valuable. For example, you know uh, we collect the massive uh, driving scenarios of uh, data and we turn the air algorithms that really detect the obstacles in China, the traffic patterns in China, and then we deploy them in massive production vehicles. So deploy them in embedded computing system in the real massive production car is a key differentiator whether you have a product or not. And then the only real evaluation is when you have massive production cars, tens of thousands of runs in you know all the streets um, you know, without limitation. Uh, and then really evaluate it. For scenario does not work, come back the data. So this loop can go on. That only channel we can improve the driving functions to cover more and more driving scenarios. Uh, but of course, the driving factor is AI. But AI is not created. AI is really being extracted from big data itself. That's why having a big fleet and generate the data is a key source, kind of like oil of the AI for this generation, especially for self-driving. Thank you very much. solution. Our solution spans from uh, software side, sensor fusion perception, um, planning control, HD map, uh, in-house infrastructure, simulation system, as well as the hardware, highly customized hardware system uh, on board and back end. So um, we are very proud that we have a very, very excellent engineering team. Um, 
although we only have a short of two years, we have set foot in Fremont, California, Guangzhou, and Beijing. Uh, our engineering team has went through uh, development cycle and delivered three generations of autonomous system so far. So at the beginning of this year, uh, we're rolling out a um, right heading fleet in Guangzhou. Uh, and now, just a couple of weeks ago, we announced our tech, uh, latest system, Pony Alpha, which is our third generation system uh, in Shanghai World AI Conference. So as you can see uh, at the bottom uh, left side, these are our Pony Alpha vehicles. So during the conference, uh, we dispatched a fleet of nine vehicles and we provide a rise to more than 1,000 visitors during the conference for uh, about seven days. We are very proud of it, and uh, currently we are working on deploying this fleet into our Guangzhou um, ride-hailing fleet. So our goal is to expand uh, the number of our vehicles from dozens to hundreds for the next year, and also uh, expanding our uh, ride-hailing fleet in a geofenced area. We think this is going to be a very big challenge and we are very excited about it. We believe that the road is live and the driving is autonomous. Thank you. Thank you, Leo. Next, we have Zhe. Hello everyone, my name is Zhuo. I'm the founder and CEO of Triple. Uh, first, thanks uh, Casper for providing this great opportunity for me to present our company. Uh, so our vision, we focus on indoor uh, robotics environment. So we are, in short, and in a very clear and simple vision, Triple is an AI home robot company. We founded in uh, 2016, so it's been uh, two years and a half years old. Uh, we have offices in Silicon Valley, uh, Shenzhen and Beijing. Shenzhen is mainly for uh, manufacture and sales, and Beijing for the core software and design, and Silicon Valley is the core uh, R&D um, for algorithms. Uh, so we are currently a total of 40 people team. Uh, speaking of the uh, robotics, so uh, usually we see the um, technology stack as application layer and technologies. So as we focusing on consumer robot, so the core Technologies, we provide an end-to-end -end integrated software and hardware system, including sensing, perception, and decision. We have been running on different um, uh, platforms, into, uh, including Intel, ARM, and NVIDIA. Uh, these are some of the core uh, technology advantages. Uh, we've been occasionally publishing as well in some uh, top robotics uh, conference in Ikora and IROS. Uh, we already started with uh, simultaneous localization and mapping. And now we have a full stack of uh, 3D geometry and uh, semantics as well. Uh, patterns, so uh, we've been um, really investing in a lot of uh, US, European, and Chinese patterns uh, as it is a must uh, for a commercial product to really uh, launch. Uh, starting 2016, the first two years, we've been working on core technology, and Iron Science is our initial inertial stereo. Um, computing module, so more than 300 universities and companies have been using it. Uh, Iron High is the uh, monocular visual inertial computing solution. So we currently have uh, more than 200k units purchase contract signed, and we are on track to deliver it. So uh, our first consumer uh, product will launch uh, 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 late this year. So any um, Casper community, uh, we can offer some discount for sure. <laughs> And uh, next year, yes, our vision is, uh, so this year's product is still a smart uh, uh, robot vacuum, but next year we want to transform into a true uh, AI robot. Here is some of the demo. Uh, on the left, you see the AeroPi uh, on a robot uh, ODM's uh, product is doing uh, SLAM uh, localization and mapping, uh, covering all every inch of your home. And on the right, some examples of our stereo uh, can doing oxygen avoidance and some semantics in understanding. Uh, this is our core vision of our next generation of product. Instead of just doing cleaning, surveillance, we want to detect the environments, interact with people, and uh, the more important, it ha a robot has to learn and become more and more uh, you know, smart. So it, has, it is an interface between human environments, so that's our uh, vision. So some of the financials, I mean, 
We've been uh, raising for more than uh, 10 million US dollars by some leading investors, including uh, Warden International, um, uh, Matrix Partners, and uh, some some ventures. Uh, last week, we just uh, closed a five million A plus round uh, from uh, alumni uh, AI Tsinghua AI Fund. And uh, yes, we've been always uh, fundraising. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Uh, next, we have Rao Ming, Vice President of Zions. Thank you. My name is Rao Ming Luan. I manage the product planning team at Zions on the software side. You heard earlier about our company with uh, Dr. Ivo Bolson, who's our CTO and esteemed uh, expert in chocolate and beer as well. <laughs> Quickly, I would like to introduce uh, Zainz for people who are not uh, familiar with the company. Uh, we, uh, since we're talking about automotive, we have been selling to the automotive market for over 12 years. So we have automotive qualified parts. Uh, we shipped uh, over 120 million parts uh, to the automotive market, more than a third of it already for ADAS and uh, 80 is uh, starting to pick up as well. We have about 4,000 employees, 3,000 of them are engineers, I would say half in hardware, half in software. Since our hardware is programmable, you need to program it, and uh, the software to develop that is, uh, is fairly complex to build, so that's half the company. We have about 56% market share, uh, the other players being uh, Intel and a few other small vendors. And uh, our revenue just passed $2.5 uh, billion dollar in revenue. And I think our CEO uh, announced that we're having a double-digit growth for the next uh, few quarters. The applications uh, that use FPGAs are uh, pretty much all around in automotive, in uh, communication, data center, uh, anything that's high-end audio or video uh, processing, including uh, medical equipment and others. In uh, automotive, uh, we, uh, we are used uh, mostly for uh, sensor fusion. So uh, as you heard in the earlier presentations, uh, FPGA's strong point are really uh, the IOs, the custom compute, and also the memory hierarchy. So for automotive, we use all of them. The IO uh, sensor fusion uh, are really the application that needs uh, a lot of IOs, especially uh, in uh, ADAS right now, there is no real standard. You can have uh, vendors that use uh, MIPI for uh, cameras, others would use uh, LIDARs, and uh, others would use the other type of sensors, and you, you really need the programmability on the IO side. Uh, compute is becoming a big requirement with AI, as you, you heard, and memory hierarchy is just needed so you can keep the data inside the chip as much as possible, so uh, you don't lose time and power communicating with uh, external memory, and you, you lose a lot of compute efficiency as well when uh, communication uh, with ex external memory becomes the, band, uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the issue, basically. So in the past four or five years, uh, we basically went from covering 14 makes in automotive and uh, 29 model to 29 makes and 111 models. And those are the ones we, we know of. And we serve directly the uh, automotive OEM, but we also sell to tier one suppliers. And those are all the red dots, uh, the different parts that use FPGAs in those cars. In terms of AI, most of the AI is uh, around the windshield for forward-looking cameras and uh, AI-based processing, as well as uh, driver monitoring. But most of it is moving in the future uh, to the central module. So all the sensors around the car will send data to the central module, which will have uh, the, the BDI processing. And uh, as you heard earlier, uh, one of the big advantages of FPGAs is that 
you can build custom hardware without going through very long sequence cycles. Sequence cycles for ASICs are a couple years, and for FPGAs, you can, within weeks or months, you can have your own custom hardware. And that's mostly attractive for domains where the speed of innovation is much, 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 much faster than sequence cycle, and that's the case for AI. Uh, here, I just put uh, a few of the uh, neural networks that uh, have been uh, published and uh, popularized in the, in the past six years, but there are an awful lot of them. So the latest one, uh, like uh, MobileNet, ShuffleNet, and so on, we uh, already have DNA, the DNN techniques that uh, those uh, networks use implemented in, in our FPGAs. Whereas uh, the latest ASIC and application-specific uh, processors were designed two years ago, and they, they're, they're efficient for all the network, but uh, they have about a 10% efficiency for those uh, networks. And finally, I wanted to retest that slide because it didn't quite work in uh, Dr. Bolson's presentation, so let me try. It works. So uh, this is an important slide, and uh, I wanted to emphasize that uh, latency is a big, big, big advantage for FPGAs because of the custom IOs and the custom data flow graph for your application that you implement uh, directly uh, in the hardware. Uh, so again, uh, GPUs needs to uh, vectorize the, uh, the fill feel of the vector, the data vector, before it can process uh, the, the whole thing, and uh, that costs latency. There are also processors, so uh, they work with interrupts, and the latency is not predictable. Whereas for FPGAs, we can parallelize the whole compute input by input and immediately get the result out. So as a re result, you get low latency, but you also get predictable latency. And uh, as uh, Ivo said, it's specifically, especially important when you're not driving the car, but the car is driving you, and the AI engine decides that it needs to break to avoid an obstacle. So that's where you really need <laughs> the lowest and the most predictable latency, and that's really uh, why uh, FPGAs are becoming so successful in ADAS and, and in AD. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next, um, let's welcome Naran, the CTO of EPAC, EPAC Computer. Well, uh, good afternoon. Uh, thanks to Danny for the invitation to Casper here. Uh, just to introduce our company, uh, ADA stands for the Greek letter efficiency, so efficient computers. Uh, so what we're focused on is to try to enable uh, edge devices uh, to be able to do most of the compute at the edge itself without having to rely on the cloud too much. So we want it to be always on, always aware kind of devices that uh, you know, will require a whole bunch of innovation in order to make that happen. So if you just think about it, we want to change our paradigm for edge devices from the traditional way to cloud way, where you have big data, big boards, big power that uh, allows you to do the computation uh, and the data resides in the, in, the, in the cloud versus the idea of having everything being little. A little board, uh, a little latency, little power, but being able to extract metadata that can, can be shared in the cloud uh, but then essentially enable all the devices that interact with the, with the real world, with the real uh, data, to be able to uh, acquire intelligence just from the interaction. Now, uh, we want to democratize the machine learning for engineers, so what I mean by that is many companies we find are not very, uh, are data shy, in the sense they don't want to put the data in the cloud. They want to be able to process, uh, you know, uh, without depending on the cloud. And, and for them to be able to uh, use uh, traditional tools, what we're enabling is a stack that we built for a complete plat platform that goes on the application layer, an accelerator, that is based on asynchronous traffic. That is, there is no clock in the, in the chip. Uh, it uh, has a BSP and a, for now it's an M3 ARM processor that we use to allow uh, uh, the plan or the portation or the porting of AI models onto a platform that's amenable for edge applications. 
Uh, so, so we are looking at four different areas at the moment. We are sampling these boards as we speak. Uh, the intelligent sensor market uh, that we're looking at, uh, intelligent vehicles, for example, uh, some Arduino based boards that we are sampling now for people to play with, uh, and also a machine learning board that we just came up with that uh, allows us to, uh, to sort of uh, make our ideas clear about how we are going to enable that. One point I just want to make in terms of the, uh, the, the whole process of autonomous learning, this is what our team is here today. We are working on, 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 on revolutionary, I believe, new technology that allows us to push uh, machine learning literally to the edge, uh, where you need, you need to have efficiency in order to make, uh, be, be able to enable these kinds of devices. Just to make my point, if you have an image of a cheetah there, there it's about 100 pixels, uh, typically you go through a dense connectivity uh, graph, you, you go through, and then you, once you have an inference model, you do ads and modifications, and then you, you come up with an inference. Uh, what if you could do this? Um, so if I play this little bit here, the same information, but then I really don't need all of it in order to be able to, to make out that that's a cheetah. For example, those pixels that are lit up uh, are, are more than sufficient for us as humans to be able to recognize that there's an animal there pretty much you know, with a few dots, maybe a cheetah as well. Uh, so we're talking about fewer neurons, uh, very few uh, additions, uh, very few pixels to process images, whereby we believe we can uh, get efficiencies that are much better than what we see today. Uh, and also, uh, we're looking at uh, this, literally the idea of autonomous learning, where the devices themselves don't have the luxury of having labeled data. So the devices are have to interact with the world, may not, maybe the data is really not amenable for uh, something that's uh, already there, and so what do we do in those cases? We want to enable those kind of applications, and so I just leave you with this little video that uh, uh, talks about basically the core idea. So somebody is going to speak a word uh, in a noisy environment, and then the system over by itself, over without any labels, starts to uh, be selective to that word. And then other people can speak the same word and it will be able to respond to it progressively. So the top plot is the data, the bottom plot is the, is the detection of the network. So just a, a quick smart. 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 So the word smart is being uttered. At the bottom, the, the network is sort of uh, learning, so to speak, and it, and this is uh, continuous data without any demarcation of where the data response appears. And over time, it, it's able to. Figure out that the structure in that particular artwork. So the speaker can be changed after that and it would still robust to that uh, respond, for example. So we believe that uh, this, this kind of capability is a necessity as we go forward in order to make edge devices uh, truly intelligent and uh, capable. And uh, we hope to enable those devices. If you are interested, uh, we can chat more. Thank you very much. Interesting. Thank you. Is actually David, yeah, head of product of uh, Baidu Autonomous Driving. So first of all, um, I'd like to thank Casper for giving me a chance to invite me to speak. So um. Uh, yeah, um, I've been told that um, I can only have like one slide to describe Apollo, uh, but the good thing is that Apollo is so popular in developers. So um, during a survey for Apollo in automobile and uh, autonomous driving industry, um, I think our brand penetration rate is about 100%, almost 100% in China, and 84% um, uh, in US. So which means a lot of people who know the name in that industry, uh, but for those who do not know Apollo, um, so I want to give you a brief introduction. So Apollo, I uh, borrowed the name from the Moonshot program. Apollo is the open autonomous driving platform that initiated by uh, Baidu from April last year. Um, I'm the head of product for Apollo in charge of the product management and project management. So in the last one year and a half, um, I lead the team to release five versions of Apollo. From the first version, um, Apollo 1.0, GPS waypoint following, uh, Apollo 1.5, uh, fixed lane following, and Apollo 2.0, simple urban roads, Apollo 2.5, geofenced highway, Apollo 
the very latest one, Apollo 3.0, is the volume products, uh, low speed and close range. So if we take a close look into Apollo the architecture, so at the very low end, uh, we have the um, vehicle certification platform. So we provide a standard interface for all the uh, automobile um, auto OEMs and also Q ones to provide us with the enabled, uh, enabled by wire enabled vehicles to talk to Apollo. And on top of it is um, hardware development platform. So we work with our developers, with our hardware providers to provide the sensing, computing, and other capabilities for the autonomous vehicles. And on top of hardware is our open source, open software platform. Um, open means that uh, we open source everything of this layer on GitHub. So anyone, you can go to GitHub and fork our code and you can get a full stack of autonomous driving software from, hard, uh, from, from map, from, from map, from localization uh, to, let's say, uh, perception, planning, control, and etc. and join our community. And on top of it um, is cloud service platform. So Baidu um, has a lot of uh, Baidu has provided a lot of uh, cloud services for time driving. So as you can remember, uh, you can think of is uh, the HD map. Baidu is the only company currently uh, who provide who has the license to provide HD map services and also uh, have autonomous uh, autonomous driving systems. And also, yeah, in simulation, you know, when we think about a, a vehicle, when we think about a driver who is an experienced driver, why we call it experience? Because the driver has seen a lot of scenarios and can act and can reflect to the scenarios. So we want to mimic it on the cloud side. We collect thousands, ten thousands of scenarios on the road and then put it on our cluster. So in our, our simulator, we have, can have our code and algorithms to run against those things to make sure that our vehicles can cover all kinds of things that we have already No. So um, Apollo also provided turnkey solutions. So currently we have the turnkey solution. On the very left, you can see the King of Bus. Uh, it's, the, uh, it's our volume product level, uh, close venue, mini bus. And also then you can see we have uh, the wallet parking, and we have the uh, micro cars, and we have the product solutions for Apollo IOBOS. Motivated by Apollo's spirit, open capability, share resources, accelerate innovation, and sustain mutual benefits. Developers and partners join our mission, and together we build a bigger and bigger of the ecosystem. So currently we have 10K plus developers, we have 120 partners and 90 projects ongoing. So no doubt, um, we are the number one brand of autonomous driving, open autonomous driving platform in the world. So I would, I want to use this chance to invite people, to invite everyone to join our mission, to join our program. So together we can make full use of autonomous driving come earlier. This can save lives, this can make the society, society more effective and for everyone. Thanks. Thank you, David. to moderate the panel of uh, AI experts. And today we're gonna talk about some interesting uh, topics and the, the trends. And then I think uh, Professor X, you mentioned that the, you know you just launched the pilot program and uh, that was the first, first step of your mission to democratizing autonomy. And uh, uh, what is the most promising in AI space? Is this the next consumer product like Tesla or grocery delivery fleet management? Well, what do you think? Yeah. Uh, okay, uh, I, I think uh, to me that's a very good question. It's very exciting that we can see all the areas that we can apply AI or time driving to make our life better. I truly believe that it will not be just one area. In the future, you will have personal passengers car like experts vehicle that is very intelligent. You will have global taxi such as like uh, Baidu is working on and uh, for all kinds of scenarios like low robot sweepers and so on. But to me it's always looking for the change that can come immediately or have the largest impact. We believe that a full and grocery delivery is probably the easiest one. 
to get started with. Why is that the case? Because as we know that after the Uber self-driving incidents, uh, the society acceptance for self-driving car is getting low. A lot of people here sitting here, and maybe I can do a quick survey first. How many people want to try to sit in a self-driving car? Raise your hand. Okay, that's quite a lot. Then, how many people want to put your children every day in a self-driving car and go to school days after days? Raise your hand. Okay, I probably see one. You can see that is people still cannot trust the technology. People still, the society still have some fear about the safety of the technology. But if the if you use a self-driving car to deliver not your children but the pizza to your house, I see everyone is more open to try, right? So this is why we see that self-driving car for like grocery for food delivery is probably going to be the first application that is high, going to be highly accessible, uh, acceptable by the by the society. And this is what we're truly exciting on. And after we get that uh, first, we can actually already use self-driving car technology to significantly improve everyone's daily life, to make your lifestyle much better. You now can enjoy that almost zero or very low cost delivery fee. Just instead of going to a grocery store, you can really spend more time doing something more valuable for your life. This is why we are very excited about that. But given that, it doesn't mean that other area we see that is not going to happen is certainly going to happen. It's all about timing. Is that which at which point the technology will show to which application. And but that's why we're truly excited about food and grocery delivery. We're really encouraging everyone to try things we're in the service area now for our uh, our, our, our auto apps self driving car technology. So do go to download the app from iOS or Android App Store. And uh, we are often limiting three day discount. And after three days that discount will be gone. Thank you. <laughs> That's a very good, um, you know, indication, and then I hope that not everybody is please order right now. How many please, cars please do you order. have? How many cars do do you have? We have, uh, we have, we have a growing fee right now in service. There are five. Five. Okay. Yeah. Anybody else uh, delivering groceries? No. Okay. Okay, you're the only one. That's great. <laughs> okay. So Leo, so you actually mentioned that uh, for for your company, Pony Million AI, and you try to build a fleet and. It's very important to turn autonomous cars into mass production and achieve scalability. So, what do you mean by the challenges in scalability? Stable, uh, uh, stability, reliability, and mass production. So, I'll start with the technical side. Uh, I think that in terms of level four uh, autonomous driving, it's always safety first. So, you have a extreme high standard for safety. Uh, with that, that means you know the uh, scalability, performance, reliability, all these factors you need to achieve a very high level. Uh, in the engineering world, I think not too many applications uh, that would require all three factors to achieve that high level. Uh, you know, normally you do an application, you probably can uh, lessen uh, less one factor to uh, sacrifice one factor a little bit to suffice the other two, and you can still make a very good product. But in autonomous driving, especially level four, it's not the case. So that means you know you have three major factors that you need to consider and maintain them while you uh, develop your technology. So this is one big challenge. Second, I I think uh, our traditional OEMs they have this over one hundred experience uh, building mass productions, but now when you look at level four vehicles. We have so many new sensors, so many new hardware, and also uh, we are installing a brain, uh, an AI brain to this to the vehicle. So no one has the prior experience how to make it work, how to make it in a mass production level. So I think that that is a brand new challenge for us. And uh, the third one uh, in, in terms of tech uh, technology, I think uh, you need to look at uh, outside of the vehicle for autonomous driving. Uh, it's not just the vehicle itself. Uh, you need to have an infrastructure because we are generating so many data. And uh, I think the three already said, you know, these data are the, you know, the, the source for your uh, AI model. So you have to collect all these data, put back into your uh, model training pipeline to efficiently improve your model. So that's something out of the vehicle, but we are building on it. We think that is a very big challenge. So these are all the technical side. 
So uh, in terms of operation side, you know, um, uh, I think Level 4 is going to uh, be a brand new um, platform and we are exploring new business model. Uh, so we need to see, you know, whether there is a business model that really can generate a mass production. And also uh, on the regulation side, you know, if the uh, government, for example, uh, in, in China, for example, they only allow a certain area, that means you have the vehicle saturation rate. You cannot do a mass production uh, over that area, right? So we, you have to see how many areas that, uh, that are allowed to deploy the fleet. Uh, you have to work with the uh, government to see, okay, we want to gradually expand in the coverage area. So that's what I mean, uh, all these challenges. So um, do you mean that um, all the cities are taken? So there is the time window actually done? It's not that all the cities are taken. If you look at really what's happening is, I think lots of cities are really want to open up. But the, right now, the open up, for example, uh, the roads that are open to, uh, for example, the testing, uh, it's not that many yet, right? So if you only have a district uh, that is open to a deployment, then how many vehicles you can put into a district, you know, uh, that, that, that needs to be considered, right? Fabulous. Um, Jun Li, you actually mentioned that, uh, you know, Xiaofeng actually make a lot of effort and collect data to actually enhance the safety and innovation in China. And uh, uh, in the meantime, you also mentioned that uh, the situation scenario is different between U.S. and China. Can you share some in, uh, insights about the evolution of AI vehicles in China versus U.S.? Uh, yes, yeah, so um, I remember I um, drove a Tesla in Beijing for a whole day and tried to understand why when it worked, when it didn't work. Um, so driving is, no one doubts driving is AI technology, but also it's a social, it reflects social norm. You'll be surprised to see that certain vehicles just don't see certain obstacles. You know, we have so many varieties of obstacles um, that, you know, goes beyond the wild imagination of any foreigners. Right. Um, for example, all the you know delivery little um, car, and then the traffic pattern are different. People like close cutting in, like um, collision from 360 uh, degrees. Right. So um, that means we need to uh, we need to build the environment, the, the data that reflect the environment. We need to build the technology that can recognize and detect all the obstacles in real time and can detect all the traffic patterns and it can predict what will happen. Prediction is very important to make driving work in China. And, and that comes to product means the, sensor, the sensing structure will be different, right? Uh, and I came to uh, realize that the hardware architecture in China and hardware architecture in the US are different. Because in China, people wanted to see close distance with more care. While in the US, people just lay back and want to see further distance uh, very, uh, very, very, uh, you know, very carefully. And then the computing in China will be high. Uh, I definitely think this generation of AI, especially for automotive, is a great opportunity for all the um, seeking uh, value folks to. Um, you know, embrace and create another wave of AI chips. And then, um, um, so the whole stack can be different in terms of how we build the platform. Uh, so that's my understanding, and then we are working very hard with the team and to build architecture into uh, the car. And I want to mention one thing, to have to perform a heart surgery on the car, uh, and working with people who make the car, it's like, a, a fire and ice kind of um, competition. Uh, it's the fundamentally, these two nature of problems is vastly different. That's, um, that's, uh, there are a lot of communication and a philosophy difference just to make it work. And also, as people mentioned, like sensing and then computing, everything is evolving. And then um, how do you make that, not just a technology prototype, but in a format of product? that can run reliable for a decade. A car needs to run reliable for a decade. That's very different from a phone or from a cloud machine. And does not allow reboot at any time and has layers of safety so that we can guarantee that 
it, you know, people's life, uh, life critical uh, events are, are guaranteed. That's all the layers of it. It's a difficult, uh, deep hierarchy of uh, vertical design. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, that's very interesting. And then in China, it seems like we not just need to work on the autonomous driving vehicle, also smart city, and to educate the you know, people better, <laughs> to, to be more defensive. Um, Okay, Joe. Uh, you mentioned that the, you know um, you showed very interesting demo that you you guys are very dedicated to uncovering the potential of uh, robotization, uh, robotization, and um, so you actually committed to enable people to create their own AVs and not just use them. So, what is the most promising use case that you actually um, have, such as like farming or drone or underwater? Uh, great question, yeah. So although we currently uh, try for focusing on uh, indoor robotic scenario, but I see uh, many like meaningful and uh, large scale, you know, application scenarios. Um, for example, farming is a great example. Um, food picking business itself is um, at least $10 billion business. Um, yeah, seeing great companies like uh, Trimble has been doing, you know, farming. Um, RB culture data itself is uh, very huge and valuable. Um, yeah, so it's, uh, it, I, I think in terms of globalization, it is happening. Um, uh, underwater is another uh, field. Um, so I just had an event last week, and a uh, professor in Michigan State, the uh, global fish for sensing and perceived environments for the underwater environment. It's just uh, um, fantastic. Uh, so one note on this is, uh, although I see, you know, if you see the core tech pillars of a robotic system, it's always you know sensing uh, sensors, uh, perception, and decision. But for every uh, specific application scenario, it requires an end-to-end -end integration. So at the end, the experience always uh, you know matters most. Um, so that's uh, how I see. But yes, um, I see globalization is happening you know in many areas. Yeah, that's very interesting and a smart approach that you guys are building the modulars. That's very interesting. And uh, remain. So, <laughs> so uh, I think AI development today is centered around deep learning algorithms like uh, convolutional uh, networks and reinforcement learning. And um, I've actually seen uh, silence that recently have uh, all kinds of customers, including some miners uh, in cryptocurrency. And and uh, uh, so what is what has changed? And there are so many startups. It used to be like semiconductor wasn't that sexy, but now like there are so much so many startups that are taking advantage of uh, maps and taking advantage of open source. And uh, so what has changed? And also is AI really the commoditizing the chip industry? Thank you. Um, is AI Commoditized in the chip industry. Um, actually, that's interesting because the semiconductor industry is really rooted in uh, commoditization because because of development cost. We 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 try to develop chips that can be uh, that, that that can serve an application that can be deployed in uh, in very high volume. And typically, those are uh, serving commodity application where standards are well set. But for AI and cryptocurrency and uh, other uh, exciting area of research uh, nowadays, uh, there really is no standard, but the high volumes are there. So uh, as, as I said earlier, the, the speed of innovation is very, very uh, rapid, faster than silicon cycles. Uh, but the volumes are there, so the, there are a lot of semiconductor startup popping up everywhere trying to do chips for crypto, chips for AI, and, uh, and, and automotive. And uh, it's also affecting Zynix because we have programmable hardware, so uh, you can actually buy an FPGA and constantly have the latest hardware accelerator for the latest AI or the latest crypto because you can reprogram the FPGA. So basically, even an old FPGA can support the latest deep learning technique and get to the 80-90% efficiency. 
And uh, that's really what's sexy to the of FPGA is in a way that it wasn't before. Also, the, the fact that we are seeing the end of Moore's Law and then scaling means that, uh, you know, in the past, FPGAs were used exclusively in the high-end application, high-end processing for video, for, for math, HPC, uh, audio, etc. But because it's been so long that CPUs have not improved in performance, and GPUs are kind of the same, but they're more vectorized, more more parallel, but inherently, when you look at it, it's, it's kind of also a, a one-woman architecture to vectorize. And it's been so long that those architecture have not grown exponentially, like the, the applications that like AI and, and, and crypto have, that basically the, the low end came to us. We're still serving the high end, but the, the mid range came to us, and now the low end is coming to us because those applications cannot be served by standard uh, processors anymore. So that, that's really what's happening. In one hand, you have Darren scaling and, and more that are bringing us the, the, the mid range and the low end. And in the other hand, you have applications like uh, AI and crypto that are extremely compute intensive, but also change very, very rapidly, faster than even cycle which make FPGA more attractive as well. You can say at a higher price. <laughs> oh, we, we would never do that. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Uh, totally agree. And also for autonomous you know, driving industry, our investment has been marketplace. And the uh, uh, second one is um, you know, enabling technology, like what you guys have been doing. And also bottleneck technology, like LiDAR and CPU and GPU and semiconductor. So those are the areas where give us the most return. I agree. And um, uh, now Ryan, <laughs> so you actually um, you know, mentioned there will be like tremendous data. I think Intel CEO said by 2020, there is like 1.5 gigabytes of traffic per day per person. And uh, so we all very familiar with cloud computing and uh, data storage, computation, and uh, analytics. And move forward, it seems like you picture us uh, you know, more like cloud and edge working together, and the storage, computation, and analytics will be like mini, um, mini data centers. So can you actually share some insights about beyond the cloud, and uh, what do you think the future of uh, edge computing? Thank you so much. Uh, so if you think about it, you know, uh, today, uh, the predictions are that there will be 50 billion edge devices. When I say edge devices, devices that are you know, going to directly, you know, the users will have in their hands, or it's going to be mounted on a motor in some industry somewhere, or that's actually dealing with the, the environment sensing it. And if you, if you can actually learn, uh, infer, and act on that data, right at the edge, rather than having to send the data to the cloud and then have to crunch the information, uh, it's going to be a bottleneck. So I, the anticipation is that uh, in fact, there's a beautiful article that Peter Levine just called the end of cloud computing, uh, where, where they predict uh, that these devices have to be more intelligent and they have to process information at the edge in order to really enable uh, an evolution. I mean, so otherwise it's going to be, you know, this cloud-based system is not going to scale up, uh, is a prediction. Now, how do we do that? I mean, so what we are thinking of uh, enabling is this fact that these devices are really don't have the ability to, uh, you know, or don't have the luxury to, 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 to have labels data, for example, uh, you know, everywhere. And so, can these devices actually make sense of their work by directly interacting with it and have some inbuilt capability to extract knowledge from, from the interaction? So, uh, and because they're edge devices, you have other issues, like you have memory constraints, you have power constraints. So can you also solve those two in, in, in sync with this one is, is, is the challenge. And so if you can do that, then all of a sudden you're enabling a whole breed of devices without having to completely rely on the cloud, solving some of the issues I mentioned earlier, like security, privacy, and so on, in addition to being very quick or having very good latency to solving the problem. So there is a market out there, there's lots of interest in what we're trying to do. The question is how well can we do it to scale up to enable so the industry is actually in its infancy, so there's much space to grow. That is great. That's great. 
Okay, for a daily. So you actually mentioned that Baidu, you know, is really trying to take AI and self-driving cars technology outside of China. And then also, I think I heard that in Japan, you guys uh, partner with SoftBank and try to launch a self-driving minibus service um, by 2019. So is China's AI companies going global a necessity and it is trending? Uh, you gave me such a big topic. <laughs> uh, how many minutes do you have? <laughs> okay, I'll just share some of my thinking. Um, I think AI, uh, AI provides a very unique opportunity for China companies to join the global technology innovations. You know, uh, technology innovation, you need the environment to support it, incubate it in the environment. So you need a government, you need a society acceptance, and you need uh, the talents, you need the capital, you need companies, you need education, a lot of those things. So before that, what well, that is before, uh, maybe only a few countries like the US has all those aspects ready. But now, I think China has catch up with this, and China is growing stronger on all of those aspects. So that makes China companies ready to join the world again. So, um, I would say that, you know, um, for the China companies, you know, um, the technologies has no boundary. You know, um, the corporations make everyone better. Baidu, for example, Baidu has accumulated strong technology. We have accumulated uh, the data processing and AI technology for decades. But compared to another industry, like automobile, I think we only automobile automobile industry has been there for hundreds of years, and we are just part of it for years, just very recently. So we have a lot to learn. So it's a desire for the Chinese companies, for China company to join the global innovation and to learn from others and to exchange technology from others. But on the opposite side, the China companies also have very, our very unique advantages. You know. AI is so fantastic, and it's the first time. I think it's the first time programmers do not need to explicitly to write a program to write features to come up with the technology. But computers can learn from itself. But how can computers learn? Computers learn from a knowledge in data. So data is the essential part of AI. China has a population of 1.3 billion. Uh, it's not only billion, it's not only billion, but it also means that one point one billion. Seven users, 300 million of patients and per year generated, and then 300 million of the vehicles on the road. As we mentioned, it definitely creates more complex world situation and more challenge data for non driving algorithms to evolve itself. So, to collect and then to be leveraged to use the data um, is a challenge, also the opportunity for China companies. So, I think. Um, the time is here, so the whole China companies, let's join the global technical innovation and try to cooperate and cooperation make everyone better as I said. I think both uh, Silicon Valley and uh, Beijing and the two areas that started as a tech giants are working very hard, very competitive. So if you, you're saying, I can do this, then that would be like, a lot of people say they can do the same thing. So very competitive. So it's actually pretty natural for Chinese companies to actually go global. Yeah, I think you, uh, one thing you have mentioned is very important. So when you say, I have technology, everyone can say, hey, I have this technology, and I can do it. Uh, it's something thing for some really metric industry, for example, like an autonomous driving. So a lot of people, a lot of companies say, I can do autonomous driving. But why are you because we think just to look how the road is just a very one step, very first step of what we are doing. We don't want to compete to each other in a very low level. Instead, we want the partners to focus on the true technology and the business cases. So we don't have to lay down the foundation for everyone and then enable everyone to work on the right? strategy. This is the mission of our goal. Say it again, so uh, open capability, share resources, Accelerate innovation and sustain it to the next. Great mission. Okay, so um, I think we got the time, but I really uh, think there was one point I want to make. Okay, so um, can I? 
Yeah, yeah. can I actually, uh, so basically that was a very important question that I want to cover today, which is ethical uh, challenges of AI. And uh, so basically, you know, the more ethics in AI and challenges, and the typical case will be, you know, um, to make a decision, and then do you want to run over for kids or to do families, and, you know, the machine has to know which way to go. And uh, that's the challenge, that's all the challenges. But there are also many other challenges. And uh, so in the meantime, I think the audience you know, wanted to have some advice, and myself, as an investor, it's a necessity for me to invest in the good people and the good cause. And can you give me and the audience some advice? And from, maybe from Professor X. Uh, that's a very good question. Actually, that's a very difficult question. Like, let's say that you have a passenger sitting in the vehicle and then now you're going to run into an accident. Due to the law of physics, you have to choose either to protect the passenger or you kill the user. Sometimes this kind of situation is really unavoidable. It is desired that's why there's so many traffic accidents that happen every day all over the world. Uh, that's exactly why we feel that all driving is unsafe. Maybe it's better to focus on something like that dimension again, like grocery or food delivery. Because this question is really, really difficult. Uh, for for human, human, if somebody kills another, like, 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 kill another low user, you'll feel that okay, it's just that, 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 that the human driver has, like, didn't pay attention, is the driving skill have problem, or it's just that person's problem. It's always very easy that you blame an individual and say that that's your fault. And then now you take a mistake, we have to, you, you suffer. But you still don't lose your confidence or all the human being, or you don't use, lose the confidence of all the human society. But for autonomous driving or for AI in general, it's different. Once you lose confidence, so from like one single instance, you feel that this car from a particular company, from one accident, accident, then you lose all the confidence. You feel that all the cars, because they are all the same, from that company, is not going to work. That's exactly why it's very difficult to avoid, uh, to do for autonomous driving to become massively of applicable in the world. And that's also exactly why we decided to choose that like, uh, food and grocery or other kind of like, uh, delivery. There's no passenger inside, and then the problem will become much easier. Your car just needs to decide to protect all the road users and maybe destroy it in the whole car itself. It's just a lot, it's not going to lose any life, it's just Okay, your pizza may kill, you may be hungry, we'll have to send another pizza for you, but that's fine. And that's also what makes you feel, make us feel that it's actually easier to make a self-driving car and become an actual reality as the first step for the human, for the human society to adapt. And when the technology becomes more and more mature, when the human, uh, people are more, more open to this kind of technology, it's going to be easier. But eventually, it's going to find ways that I am not. It's going to be a very difficult time. I don't see anyone in the world have a really good answer for that. And our answer is let's start with something easier. That's not for the human inside the time. Thank you. <laughs> Can I add something to this? Sure, yeah. So, um, I'm very familiar with this question because I have been asked for this question a lot, a lot of times. Uh, the ones that um, a film company uh, in Hollywood uh, interviewed me and asked this question. I, I guess they're trying to collect some materials for their next film. <laughs> so um, I think it's very difficult for, for humans, and that's exactly why we developed autonomous driving. So autonomous driving is not trying to help you make a decision in this dilemma, whether you are going to kill someone outside the car or kill someone inside the car. But the spirit of autonomous driving, the value of it, is to prevent this from happening in early stage. You know, ninety-four percent of the traffic accident is general. It's caused by human force. If we have autonomous driving, we can eliminate human human problems in the narrows. That will make the road more effective and more important, more safe for everyone. So, you know, a um, hundred years ago, when the cars began to to yeah, well, when the cars games, it's no, it's not more safe. It's not safer than the horse cart. But in this, if today you see a horse cart on the road, you may doubt, oh, what is safe enough? 
Can you see the traffic lines and can maybe cross the, the lane lines? Just because those things happen after the car was there. You see it? So when a car body is in the trend, the society, the government, the history will help the technology if it's, I mean, if it's more effective, will help the technology to become more true. And then, in the end, will help the technology to become more safe for everyone. So this is the spirit, this is the core value for a time driving. We are not going to make a decision on this part, but we are going to prevent the accidents from happening in the beginning. That would be great. Do you have an advice, Renee? Do you have the time? Oh, okay, yeah, sure. Well, um, I don't really have an advice there. We just put a chip that accelerates what's going on. But, but please make the road safer. <laughs> Chinese company we acquired by the name of DeFi. 
And when you think about it, uh, it doesn't have to be as pixelized as you saw in the Jaguar picture. We can actually get more than 99% of the same accuracy with one tenth of the compute. And when you think about it, that's what nature is doing to you, to your brain. Uh, when you were one years old, you had a lot more neurons than you have today, but hopefully you're smarter today, right? Because you, you, you learn specific things, and then your brain specialized for those things and became smarter and smarter and smarter, although you may have a tenth of the neurons, and th that's exactly what we do. So we enable uh, algorithms that could not be implemented before because they were too compute intensive. Now we can do them with 99% of the accuracy and with a super fast and super predictable latency to enable the algorithm makers to, to make decisions much, much, much faster and, and save lives. That's great. Uh, Leo, you probably have been thinking of about this question you know, all the time. Yeah, I'm actually thinking if we have all, um, all the vehicles are autonomous, we're going to be much easier and much safer. Uh, you know, people are thinking of that, yeah, because people do make mistakes a lot. Uh, many of the fatalities are coming from human errors, uh, human faults. So, uh, but we have to deal with it. Right now, uh, we have all the vehicles plus autonomous vehicles. So, uh, when we are doing the testing, I think still uh, we have to make uh, safety first. So, uh, there are certain scenarios. Uh, at this point, we are kind of sacrificing the comfortableness. Uh, to, to guarantee the safety at this moment. But I think that's necessary. Um, and also, I think in terms of the uh, safety insurance, uh, I believe that uh, you know, building up a simulation system is really, really important. Uh, currently, we have a house simulation system that we are running every day for every code merge, code fork. So uh, I think we have gathered the data both in, uh, in China scenario and also US scenarios. So the system is running, I think, at least 25k miles per day. So that's kind of to ensure our code can pass thousands of scenarios. Uh, so that is also very important. Um, then I think, uh, you know, for the safety part, um, it's always going to be a concern for the major public, but uh, you have mentioned like the flight, uh, flight, right? So for the aviation, for example, I think, yeah, that's a very good example. Uh, uh, when it first gets started, you know, nobody feels it's really safe, but looking now, actually it's one of the safest transporting method compared to even to the vehicles, right? So, yeah. That's a great point. And uh, Julia, do you have any advice for people in the audience want to get into this industry? Inside, they're already very much competition. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just following the, the topic. So, um, so, yeah, I have several aspects. The first is, uh, for example, ethics wise, you know, um, ethics, uh, safety concern, there's a certain line I feel uh, you just cannot cross. So that's very serious stuff. And I mean, that's, uh, yeah, so that, that's it, right? And on the other side, uh, I feel, I mean, I've been in the robotics for several years, uh, for kind of more than 10 years. So a lot of technology-wise, uh, when applied to um, self-driving, I just see technology, it, it's just hard. I mean, uh, multi-robot um, scheduling and task planning itself is a lot of, you know, sophisticated game theory involved. Um, so that's, I kind of echo what Leo said, like if simulation is really uh, powerful and kind of hard, um, I don't know, 94, 95 percent, that would be great. Uh, I went to the robotics conference, I'm seeing uh, researchers using GTA game to get the simulation data, I mean, there has to be better than that. Um, yeah, so I, I, but for the technology wise, I think uh, for autonomous driving, maybe it's, um, I mean, it's to rely on a little more external powers like government or, you know, infrastructure like E2X, car, car uh, communication, that infrastructure itself can kind of help it. But technology wise, I think it's just super hard. Thank you very much. Um, I think it's a uh, really important, important question that you guys answered, and, answer and, and uh, I think we've got time. So, so I think we've got a lot of applause.
sure we see you a token of appreciation. And then for our audience, um, there are a couple more things uh, before we let you go to, uh, to either dinner downstairs or um, whatever you have planned for the evening. Uh, we have, uh, we're going to announce the result of uh, our board of, director, uh, board of directors election uh, right after this. And then after that, we have prize drawings. And we have, among other things, smart, the latest smartphone from Huawei. So please, uh, please stay where you are. Thanks. <laughs>